Thank you, Tom, for your second invitation. I enjoy watching your interviews with people from different backgrounds and professions. Tom Nelson podcast is an eye opener for me. It seems to me the information density was a little bit too high in my first talk. That's why I have decided to use more graphic illustration this time. In fact, my talk today is a graphic explanation for climate stability. Why stability? Well, so far, many talks and uh, papers have been focused on the change, either the weather change or climate change, which could be very time consuming for many people. In many cases, people are talking about weather, but actually they are talking about climate and vice versa. In my opinion, it is equally, if not more, important to understand why the surface temperature has been so miraculously stable, almost as stable as the human body temperature. One can hardly deny this fact by looking at this abnormally populated by IPCC. Of course, it's popular to talk about the Minankovitch, the happiest prisoner, the radiation from the sun, and the CO2-related transportation problem, but they are all just perturbations, external or internal, not necessarily the response of the Earth, which have been there for over 4 billion years since the formation of the Moon. Over the past few years, I have been very concerned about the natural capability of this planet in its dynamic adaptation to these perturbations due to his never ended efforts in restoring local and global thermal equilibrium, which I call this process as a equilibriumization. Of course, never has such a local equilibrium been achieved near the surface, as we can see seasonal and diurnal weather variations everywhere. But we should be grateful for our planet, for his never ended effort without pain, rather than to complain any kind of weather. I suggest NASA have a mission to send those people who complain the extreme weather to Mars or Venus. So far, I have started three means as listed here. The outgoing long wave radiation called OLR, the real north, not controlled by human, fortunately, water and gravity. Today's talk is confined to the OLR. Here is a long-term observation of the global mean OLR at the top of the atmosphere, which clearly shows our Earth has no constipation problem. This is the Earth's overall response to all possible perturbations you can imagine. Those who trust the logarithmic formula for calculating radioactive forcing or Hasselman's stochastic climate model must have subconsciously believed the Earth is incapable of looking after itself. Hence, the Earth needs human's help. What a joke! As one species, human on this planet is less than 50,000 years compared with the age of Earth, 4 billion. How could they think so? The blanket effect was first used to explain why the diurnal temperature difference on the Earth is so different from the Moon. It had become popular after John Tyndall observed that CO2 can absorb a certain amount of infrared. Arrhenius proposed his climate model two years before the 50 micron CO2 absorption was experimentally observed. How could we trust his predictions? The physicist who first replaced the blanket effect 
by the greenhouse effect was John pointing, but he was just pointing without any explanation. He was famous for his pointing vector to describe how electrical energy flies in space with electromagnetic wave. I remember James Maxwell asked him, but where does the energy reside? You can find my recent critique on pointing vector on my channel. This is another reason why so many people accept the greenhouse effect more or less. The key number for this magical greenhouse effect is 33 Kelvin. That's to say, without CO2 and other infrared absorbers, the Earth's surface temperature would be 33 Kelvin colder. This is a frequently quoted greenhouse effect version one. However, the actual number is less than 10 Kelvin, as I pointed out in my first talk, because the reflectivity of black body is zero rather than 0 0.3. Should the planetary reflectivity is 30%, then the emissivity of this gray body, not black body, would be 70%, close to the 61% today. It would appear when Wingardium and Hepper knew this, but they simply ignore it and even cover it up. Even this number wouldn't affect their calculation for upward non-wave radiation. Notice, I am talking about the greenhouse effect version one, which assumed that the CO2 concentration was just right, just as a constant in physics, to enable the wanted global warming exactly equal to 33 Kelvin before the Industrial Revolution. Here is a simplified diagram for the IPCC's climate model. Can you see the greenhouse in the sky? It can absorb at 541 watt per meter square, not the original 155 anymore. As you can see, the downward atmospheric radiation is 63%, and the upward atmospheric radiation is 37%, which is violates the basic law of thermodynamics. Still, it implies that the UN can redistribute uh, 63 of the world's wealth to the developing countries and just 37% uh, to the developed world. In digital currency though, politically correct and consistent with the future socialism isn't it? Now, some latest progress in my research. So far, it has been taken for granted by climate researchers, including myself half years ago, that the surface at its mean temperature, 288 Kelvin, radiates upward non-wave radiation, closer to 394 watt per meter square all the time. However, it can be justified by Stefan Boltzmann law if and only if there is a no gaseous atmosphere. Unfortunately, such an essential condition has been obscured by modeling the atmosphere as a separate layer above the ground ever since Arrhenius in 1896, as shown in this middle diagram. Nevertheless, once we eliminate the vacuum gap between the fake atmosphere and the real condensed matter surface, guess what? The upward terrestrial radiation should be zero. Why? Simple. According to zero's law in thermodynamics, when two objects reach the common temperature, the net heat transfer should be zero. This implies that it is ordinary air molecules, primarily nitrogen and oxygen, 
rather than those trace infrared absorbers such as H2O and CO2 and uh, the farting and cow. That can act as a blanket to diminish the terrestrial radiation. I also noticed the two Williams were puzzled by this boundary condition when they tried to figure out how to calculate their upward radiation. Please let me know if I am wrong. In light of this coronary of the zero snow, the IPCC's diagram for global energy balance can be replaced by this new one that I can explain to you in one minute. Look, the coming solar radiation is reflected and absorbed by the atmosphere all the way to the surface. The total planetary reflection is 100 or 30%. As you can see, no surface radiation, as the shortwave radiation from the sun is completely transferred from the surface into the atmosphere by means of convection and conduction. The total atmospheric absorption, 78 plus 161 watt per meter square, to be exact, will warm up the atmosphere. Worried? Concerned? Take it easy. Our atmosphere will completely sink any surplus into the outer space by means of thermal radiation. By the way, this is one of the slides I deleted before I sent it to you last time. Otherwise, the information density would be too high. Here is a new formula for calculating the OLR. Please watch my channel if you want to know more about this in detail. Any experimental evidence for this claim? Well, Tom Schooner has shown his latest results that non-radioactive mechanism, namely the conduction and the convection, is over 99.6% at one atmosphere pressure, that is at the sea level. So this is one. In fact, there are many observational data since 1900 that can be considered as experimental evidence for air thermal radiation. Personally, I admire those European pioneers who climbed to mountain Whitney and even uh, mountain Everest to measure the thermal radiation from the sky. In particular, I wish to know more about this uh, A.K. Armstrong who first proposed an empirical formula for the atmospherical emissivity in relation to air pressure and temperature, of course, air density as well. Alas, this research area has been hijacked by the IPCC to justify the strong back radiation hypothesis. Another trigger for me to initiate my investigation on climate stability was a paper published 10 years ago by Wei Yin Zhong, not me, and uh, Joanna Hay from the UK. Basically, they argued that the CO2 will continue warming up the surface at a much higher concentration forever, or in their words, there are nowhere near saturation. In particular, they used the irrelevant term supralogarithmic to make reader scary. I hope my cartoon will tell you something, but I would like to explain it a bit more. It has been tradition in China. If you are there to overthrow the government, your head will be cut off and hung at the entrance of the city. In physics, researchers do use logarithmic scale to illustrate extremely large or small quantities. That would be impossible to display in a linear uh, scale. But bear in mind that one must use the same scale when comparing to different quantities. 
if you simply cut and paste the CO2 peak at 667 per centimeter from the two diagrams in their original paper, you will see the two peaks are almost identical. Nevertheless, the vertical axis in the figure on the left hand one is linear, while the vertical axis on the right hand side is logarithmic. How could they do that? To make my point clearer, let's compare the two calculated IR spectra. The left one is in linear scale, and the right one is in logarithmic scale. As you can see, only the tiny fraction of the peaks inside this green frame on the right figure can be measured by an IR spectrometer. This has nothing to do with the instrumental resolution as suggested by many researchers. In other words, the spectral density of the sideband is over 10,000 times weaker than the central peak. How could one expect an FTIR spectrometer detect such a weak signal from remote wind in space? Here is another breakthrough in illustrating the atmospherical absorption and emission, as shown in this 3D staggered diagram. For over a century, climate researchers have been confused themselves in visualizing the outgoing non-wave radiation, the atmospherical absorption and atmospherical radiation in the atmosphere to explain their greenhouse effect version two. If you have a close look of this uh, skewed spectral profile called the Planck function, you can see it is made by two colored area similar to a map. The, the blue sea area is the transmitted infrared radiation, presumably come from the surface. But where is OLR and the upward atmospherical radiation? you have to draw them elsewhere, as shown by these two origin color components. They represent the upward atmospherical radiation spectra in 1850 and today, respectively. Can you see the CO2 emission peak is slightly higher after CO2 doubling? Remember, the emission peak is always upward. If you want to illustrate the OLR and the terrestrial radiation together, the difference between them is the green colored area. Since the 1980s, this green area has been mistakenly defined as the greenhouse effect or radioactive forcing. In short, one can only use two different colors to fill up with this skewed profile either the IR absorption and the IR transmission, or the OLR and the greenhouse effect. If you use this criterion, you can easily identify the diagram used by the two Williams is wrong because it contains three different colors, namely the red CO2 absorption, the origin OLR, and the green radioactive forcing. It cannot be true, similar to the Pauli exclusion principle for fermions. Of course, this is not entirely their fault. To trace the origin of this mistake, I am obliged to mention the late Dr. Rudolf Hanel, who passed away over 10 years ago. He was the NASA chief investigator for the IRIS on the Nimbus 4 mission from 1996 onward. In short, he decided to put this CO2 peak upside down in the calculated forward IR spectra to conform with the vertical temperature profile of the US atmosphere standard. Technically, he implemented a pi phase shift or 180 degree phase shift, then published 
in nature in 1970. That is why the CO2 emission peak is always upside down in all of the OLR spectra simulated so far, except for the look down satellite observation, where the local surface temperature is lower than atmosphere. That is what I have been investigating. Finally, I would like to show you another color recognition game that even children can play. It is simply explain why CO2 cannot block IR radiation, as Arrhenius first thought. Notice both O and F, or OLR and the radiative forcing, respectively, are constants. In summary, it has been shown that the way to treat the atmosphere as a separate layer above the surface is incorrect as first introduced by Arrhenius in 1896. The same defect has been found in the IPCC's current state-of-the-art climate model because the vacuum gap is still there. By eliminating this vacuum gap, the terrestrial infrared radiation becomes zero as far as the long-term global mean climate stability is concerned. Thank you for your viewing. Any questions, please?